You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. You love history, science fiction, and role-playing. What if there was a podcast that brought all these things you love together in a deep, dramatic experience you'll never forget? Enter the Twilight Histories, a campaign-style storytelling podcast that casts you as the hero. With the Twilight Histories, you will travel to exotic worlds spread across the multiverse. Some are familiar, others are totally exotic. You'll visit Egypt locked in an ice age. You'll follow the Mongols across the American plains. You'll explore a terraformed Venus. Pick your adventure and experience a world out of time. The Twilight Histories was awarded one of Apple's Best of the Year and has been nominated for numerous awards in speculative fiction. Now, step on the platform and let's get you on your way. Let the Twilight Histories podcast carry you to a different world. Hi, I'm Annie in the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you are listening to your favorite international podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of Fresh Hell. You know we're the podcast hosted by two online friends who I've never met in real life, but we still get together once a week online to talk about everything terrifying and creepy so we can share it with you. And as always, we would love to thank all of you for your support and just the nicest messages you're awesome. Mm. We want to send a very special thank you to our newest patrons. And they are Jocelyn Oyarzo. Thank you. Emma Sanchez. Thanks so much. Elizabeth Lawrence. We appreciate it. And Elizabeth Richmond. Thank you very, very much. It just means so much. We just really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, one more other thing. Shout out to Rick from Utah. Your reviews always make me laugh. Rick sends us like little, little message updates sometimes through reviews and it just, we're delighted by it. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, we definitely see you, Rick. Thank you. I'd say we jump right into today's episode, which is part two of the Nicholas Markowitz story. If you haven't listened to the first part yet, please stop this episode right now and go back to episode 150. Listen to that one first. Otherwise, you will have no idea what's going on and what we're even talking about. And just like last week, our biggest source for this case was Susan Markowitz's book, My Stolen Son, which we can highly recommend. And a quick content warning, this week we will be discussing the death of a minor. And for those of you who already listened to part one last week, here's a quick recap. 15-year-old Nicholas Markowitz lived with his parents in West Hills, an affluent residential neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. He also had two half-siblings, one of them, his older brother Ben, got himself into trouble on a regular basis, vandalism, grand theft auto, and later on drug dealing. He got involved with the wrong people, one of them was a young dealer and self-proclaimed mob boss, Jesse James Hollywood, who at age 20 had managed to build a small-scale drug ring by hiring his childhood friends to sell drugs for him. Unfortunately, Ben managed to get into a fight with Hollywood. The fight was about a $1,200 debt that Ben refused to pay. On 6th of August 2000, Jesse James Hollywood and some of his friends were driving around the neighborhood looking for Ben when they came across Nick. They pulled their car over, jumped out and started to beat the 15-year-old before dragging him into their van and driving off. Nick was now the victim of a kidnapping. The gang made their way to Santa Barbara where they had planned to attend a festival celebrating the town's Spanish heritage. Nick's parents, Jeff and Susan Markowitz, had no idea where their son was. And that's where we left off last week. Nick is held captive by Jesse James Hollywood there in Santa Barbara in the apartment of a friend of Jesse Rugi. They have blindfolded the teenager, gagged him, and tied him up, but they had no idea what to do next. William Skidmore, who was also in the van when Nick was kidnapped, and the boy named Brian, who had joined the group in L.A. before they drove to Santa Barbara, were feeling pretty uncomfortable about the entire situation. They weren't into it, no. They're like, listen, we're so... It's been a day. Ooh, we're tired. Also, my pet rock needs some attention. And also, 
my grandma needs a foot massage, so bye. Like, whatever excuse they gave, they yeah. noped right out of that fucking situation. I mean, they wanted to. Well, yeah, they wanted to get out of it. But Jesse James Hollywood was not having any of it, and he tells them to stay and watch Nick while he and Jesse Rugi, one of his old friends from Little League, left. And you'd think, given the fact that they felt so bad about having kidnapped this boy, that they would just let him go as soon as the two Jessies had left. But no. They stayed there, watching Nick and waiting for the tough guys to come back. And once the Jessies returned to the apartment, Hollywood did dismiss Brian and William Skidmore. They then untied Nick and sat down to smoke a drink with him. Then Hollywood decided that Jesse Rugi was now responsible for Nick, and he would be the one to babysit the teenager until they could either get a hold of Ben or figure out some other plan. And with that, Jesse James Hollywood left. Yeah, I think that Hollywood said that he had to finish moving out of his house or something similar, which... Again, just like last week where they stopped to pick up Skidmore's uh, insulin after the kidnapping, it's just so bizarre and insulting in a way. Like, these guys have not a single care in the world, all the while Nick's parents are living through the worst nightmare. And now Jesse Rugg is left with Nick and he just takes him home to his house, where he lives with his dad. And he asks his dad if his friend can stay over. And his dad is like, sure, you can stay. And he actually thinks nothing of it. And to be fair, I doubt that I would have felt that something was off. First of all, I'm extremely naive in certain situations, even though I'm not an overall naive person, if that makes sense. It does, which is good, because I am. I'm sometimes so naive, I'm just amazed I'm still here. Was it a thing, like when you were a kid, to have someone tell you that, hey, did you know if you look up the word gullible in the dictionary, there's no definition for it? And I was like, wow, really? And then, of course, I'm like, <laughs> ugh. Pe people do this to me all the time. My friends do this to me all the time. I think, despite all, we mostly believe that there is good in most people, I guess. Right? Yeah. That's why we're a yeah. little bit naive. I have to admit, though, that uh, I turned more cynical the older I got. It's made me suspicious. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's best to just assume everything is a long con <laughs> and just hope that it's not. We had Netflix for like three years before I relaxed and stopped giving it the scammy side eye. I did not trust that process, but... Yeah, your friend, your kid bringing a friend home, I don't think that's suspicious. Yeah, so first of all, I'm very naive. But second of all, Nick didn't act like he was being kidnapped. I think that after they had untied him, he probably felt way more relaxed. I mean, yeah, he was beaten up in the beginning, but now they were actually quote-unquote friendly with him. Mm. If you can ever call this situation friendly, for the lack of a better term, though. And they keep telling him that not to worry, that they were just looking for Ben. And once Ben would show up, he could go home. And so I'm sure Nick thought that, hey, my older brother will show up eventually and pay the money. You know, he was probably thinking that his dad would give it to him and they would not harm him. And, you know, he just wanted to wait it out. Yeah. In the meantime, Jeff and Susan were still at home. They're still trying to find Nick. They're calling his friends, telling them to just please let them know the moment they hear anything from him. And they still didn't hear anything back from Ben. So there was a hope that maybe Nick was with his older brother. They wouldn't hear from Ben until Monday when he showed up at their house. He had been out of state on some business. He was working construction at the moment. And so he had no idea where Nick was and hadn't heard from him. This must have been... Just such a devastating moment oh, God, for Nick's yeah. parents, right? Because I think up until that point, they were still telling themselves that he was fine, he was with his brother, like things would mm. be fine. But then when Ben showed up, it was now obvious that something must be really wrong. Something had to have happened. And there are just so many things that could happen to a person, right? We just were talking about an article we read where someone disappeared because they'd fallen into a manhole and their mm. body wasn't found for years. Or people can get hit by cars. Yeah, my mom and I one time called all nearby police stations and hospitals because we couldn't get a hold of my sister uh, for hours and hours. And the last thing we knew was that she had been driving, so we feared that she had been involved in an accident. She wasn't, thank God. She was at friends and didn't bother sending us a quick text. But yeah, things happen every single day. Yeah, it's awful calling hospitals to describe somebody. And I think, you know, given Ben's past, it's no surprise that Jeff asked Ben... Did he have any enemies? Again, I think that's super smart. Me being so naive, that would have been so far from, you know, something on my mind. But yeah, right. that's an excellent question, actually. Because who has enemies? Like, do you have yeah, enemies? True. Do you have enemies? We're not the Tindler swindler. Yeah. So I think Susan Markowitz wrote in her book that Ben then told them that he owed $1,200 to a drug dealer. And 
even though that's the first sort of clue the family has, they don't really make the connection yet. I think that those couple of days must have just been a blur to Nick's parents, but Ben Mm. was asking around, and he had heard that Nick was seen with Hollywood partying, but I don't think he'd mentioned that to his parents. I don't think Susan and Jeff knew about that yet. And so it seems that Ben thought, yes, Jesse James Hollywood had something to do with the disappearance of his younger brother, but I don't think he ever thought anything would really happen to him. And they were probably just hanging out together to spite him, something like that, Mm. you know? That he would come home, like Nick would come home and like, hey, I've been with Jesse James Hollywood, he's so cool, or something like that, some bullshit like that. Right, now he's as cool as his older brother, right? Just something benign, relatively benign, right? Worst case scenario, his brother's just taken off for a few days to hang out with girls and do some drugs yeah. party, right? In any case, Ben calls Hollywood's house and he leaves a message saying that he's looking for his brother and that Hollywood should contact him if he hears anything from Nick, which is, it always bothers me that they kidnapped Nick and then never actually tried to contact Ben. It's like, so if the weird, whole point yeah. was to yeah. get the money back from Ben. Yeah. They didn't contact Ben. Susan and Jeff then decide to print out missing persons flyers. And so working with a group of volunteers, they start to spread them all over West Hills. So now it's Monday, August 7th, 2000, and Ben is trying to figure out where Nick is. Nick's parents are handing out flyers. They're hanging up posters. And Nick is with Jesse Ruge. They had started their day by watching some TV and playing video games. Later on, some friends showed up at the house, and two teenage girls, one 16 and one 17, and a 17-year-old boy by the name of Graham Presley. His name will be important to the case. So, Jesse Ruge introduced Nick as one of his L.A. friends, and they all smoked some weed and just were hanging out playing video games. Typical teenager stuff. Yeah, that sounds like every apartment uh, I visited in college. So, yeah. The three teenagers only realized something was wrong when Jesse Ruge told them not to let Nick use the phone when he was leaving for a little while. He was going to meet up with Hollywood so they could come up with a plan. You know, what's what's the old phrase? Uh, a stay cool and hope for the best. They had to meet up and figure out what they were going to do. That comes across as odd, though. Why would you say don't let your friend use a phone? It's yeah. weird. Like, if they had just left, it probably would have been fine. But they start asking Nick what's going on, and so he tells them what had happened, that he was just kind of kidnapped, but it was all going to be okay, and he was waiting for his brother to clear things up. And so the two girls start to call Nick Stolen Boy, and it all seems like not such a big deal to any of them. And they actually ask Nick why he isn't just leaving now, like, Rugi's gone, why don't you just leave? But Nick said he didn't want to get anyone in trouble, and it would all be okay, because pretty soon he felt sure Ben would show up. As you said before, I think Nick was just more relaxed around them by now. Like, they'd been treating him like a buddy, getting him high, Mm -hmm. and it's like he's almost starting to trust them, which just makes this all even more heartbreaking. So sad. Mm. All right, so we know what Ben and Susan and Jeff were doing. We know what Jesse Ruge and Nick were doing, but what about Jesse James Hollywood? He summons a lawyer to his home. Not only does this 20-year-old have a house and some expensive cars, he also has his own lawyer, and the lawyer makes house calls. To be fair, it was probably the family's lawyer. But anyway, he talks to his lawyer, and Hollywood tells him that he has friends who were in some legal trouble. Always the friend of a friend. Yeah, the friend of a friend, and just allegedly these friends had beaten up a teenager and taken him, and he had nothing to do with it, but like... What should he tell his his friend's mm. friend's friend, right? So the lawyer asks him a couple of questions. Where is the kid? What are they doing with him? Is he tied up? Did they ask for ransom? Normal questions you would ask somebody who's been involved in a kidnapping, right? And the reason he's asking is because depending on the circumstances, this would be a prison sentence of eight years to life if ransom was involved. But it was definitely, definitely serious. Now, there exist two versions on what was the legal advice by the lawyer. So, according to the lawyer, he said, well, call the police and get the boy home. Which sounds like a good advice, right? I think so. According to Jesse James Hollywood, the lawyer said, dig a deep hole. So, later that day, the lawyer told Hollywood's dad that his son was in some trouble and that they should all meet up and talk things through. 
And so they did, about 2 a.m. on Tuesday, which is the 8th of August. 2 a.m.? Like drug dealers' hours. It's because his father was out on vacation, I think. He came back, like, in the morning hours. That's why. Gotcha. And Nick was gone for one and a half days already at that point. And apparently Hollywood Senior then tried to get his son to tell him everything. You know, first of all, where Nick was now. And his plan was to get Nick, scare him, you know, that he doesn't talk about what had happened, and then get him home somehow. But Jesse James Hollywood would not tell him where the boy was. Now it's Tuesday and Nick is still at Jesse Ruge's house. The same people then the day before are there, the two girls and Graham Presley. And the girls now actually question Jesse Ruge and what the fuck is going on and why is Nick still here and that he should, you know, get him back home. But Ruge tells them not to worry, nothing would happen to Nick and he's sure that Hollywood will let him go soon. If not, he will put him on a bus and, you know, he would send him back home to his family. I don't know, I I somehow have the feeling that at that point he really believed it. Mm -hmm. That all of them really believed it, probably except for Hollywood, who seems to have been very unsure of what to do next. But at one point he did apparently offer Jesse Ruge some money to get rid of Nick. I think that was the day before when they met to talk things through. So maybe maybe Jesse Ruge didn't actually believe that everything was going to be okay. I don't know. I think yeah, we don't. it's hard to. We can't know that. No, we can't. Anyway, nobody called the police. Nobody did anything. Everyone decided to stay out of this and mind their own business. It's now Tuesday evening, 8th of August, 2000. Nick is now missing for two and a half days, and Jesse Ruge decides that he's tired of sitting around the house, tired of babysitting Nick, and so he decides that they should all go out partying. And so Graham Presley asks his mom if she can drive all of them to a nearby hotel, the Lemon Tree Inn. So weird, you have this kidnapped teenage boy, and you're like, Mom, can you take us to the, the Lemon Tree Inn? We're gonna party over there. Like, and She's like, yeah, kids, get in the car. I'll drive you. Hop in the way back. <laughs> it's bizarre. So on the homepage, the hotel is described as follows. Quote, the Lemon Tree Inn is located on the historic site of the Mountain View Auto Court. Built in 1920, the Mountains View is considered the first modal type operation in California. The original Lemon Tree Motor Hotel was built in 1960 on the site of a horse pasture and included our first 38 guest rooms, our large swimming pool, meeting room, lobby and pot cocher with his landmark zigzag roof. In 1965, part of the original Mountain View Auto Court property was sold to the Alpha Beta Grocery Company, which became a very successful grocery store location and shopping center. Most of the original Mountain View Auto Court was demolished, which made space for the addition of another 17 guest rooms to the Lemon Tree Motor Hotel. The hotel was operated as a Vagabond Inn from 1968 until 1993, when the Lemon Tree name was restored. Plans were prepared and the Lemon Tree Inn was expanded to its current configuration in 1996. The hotel now has 96 guest rooms, the Crocodile Restaurant and Bar and elevator service to all floors. Ooh, fancy. The hotel's architecture is in the international style. <laughs> what international style? Okay. I don't, what is international style? The hotel's architecture is in the international style, popular in the 60s, And through the changes, elements of this style were carefully retained and integrated into our modern additions. The essence of the original order code can still be felt at the lemon tree and we are respectful of its 1960s heritage. The understated elegance and functional arrangement of our facilities make the lemon tree a unique and memorable experience. End quote. Nice. I looked it up. It actually looks pretty nice for kind of a motel style hotel. It looks nice. I had to look up Vagabond Inn when, when I was first reading. I'm like, Vagabond Inn? It was an inn for for vagabonds? Like, what? It was actually a hotel chain, but only in California. So that's why I'd never heard of it. They're, they're still around. You can still stay at a Vagabond Inn. And they look like they're all these, like, 60s style motels. So they arrive at the hotel. They rent a room. Then they sit around the room drinking and smoking weed. And later they take the party outside to the whirlpool. And again, the girls ask Nick why he doesn't just leave. And again, he tells them that everything will be fine. He's not worried at all. Uh, Nothing would happen to him. And he doesn't want to complicate the whole thing for anybody. And he also said worst case scenario, he knew Taekwondo. So he felt that he would be able to protect himself. I think he probably, and I don't know how else to word it, 
he might have enjoyed himself. Like, he was hanging out with people a bit older, he was smoking weed, he was partying, the girls were nice to him. I think he even said something like, oh, this is going to be a great story to tell my grandkids. Yeah. I think one of the things I kept thinking of when I heard this story and why I think why it's so sad is it kind of, it reminds me a little bit of the film Dazed and Confused, right? Where the kids are kind of like the younger kids are sort of like beaten up, but then they all mm -hmm. go party with the older kids. And I keep wondering if he was thinking of that film and I keep, do you know what I mean? Because in that one, everything's fine. Yeah. It's like an initiation almost to be cool like these other older kids. So I don't know. I just keep thinking of that and it keeps making me really sad. It's also a crowd his older brother, who he idolizes, is a part of, right? He wants to fit in with this crowd. One of the things also that's just, as I said, breaks my heart is he's just so vulnerable at that age to influences of other kids. And they just kind of got him at, at his most vulnerable time, right? It's so, that's the age where you're so vulnerable, but think that you're absolutely not. Yes. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yes. You think you're an adult who knows everything. Yeah. And that you... Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. And of course, Nick wasn't aware of the fact that Hollywood had offered money to Jesse Ruge to get rid of Nick. Jesse Ruge had refused the offer. But who did Jesse James Hollywood turn to next? Who was his eager little servant who still owed him a little bit of money? He had worked his debts down to, I think, like a few hundred dollars. It was barely anything. I, I read it was like 200 or 300 dollars. So. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of money. But who felt he needed to prove himself to Hollywood and the gang that he, too, was just more than the guy who cleans toilets and picks up dog poop? That's right. It's Ryan Hoyt. So Hollywood told Hoyt that he would forgive his debt again of like a couple hundred dollars if he would clean up the mess that he and the others were in. And with that, he hands Hoyt a Tech 9 semi-automatic pistol, and it had been illegally converted into a fully automatic weapon that I believe it fired more than 10 rounds a second. It was a machine gun, basically. And Ryan took the gun and knew exactly what was expected of him. After Hoyt had left to drive to Santa Barbara, Jesse James Hollywood then went out to dinner with his girlfriend. Meanwhile, back at the Lemon Tree Inn, shortly before midnight, Jesse Ruge told everyone that the party was now over and everyone should go home because someone was about to arrive to pick Nick up and take him home. So everybody's hugging the stolen boy goodbye, trading phone numbers, and making plans to stay in contact and get together and meet up soon. And now, the only ones that are left at the rented room at the hotel are Jesse Ruge, Nick, and Graham Presley. Then Ryan Hoyt arrived. Jesse Ruge later claimed that he only realized what was about to happen when Hoyt arrived at the Lemon Tree Inn. Up until that point, he was convinced that Nick was going home. Graham Presley saw that Hoyt had a gun on him, but he didn't say anything. Not even when Jesse and Hoyt left the hotel for a bit, he could have warned Nick, called the police, or simply left with Nick. But he didn't do any of those things. Now, where did Jesse Ruge and Ryan Hoyt go when they left the hotel? They drove to Ruge's home and they picked up two shovels and duct tape and then they returned to the hotel and Ruge now stayed with Nick while Presley was asked to go with Hoyt. That's because Graham Presley knew the area better and so Ryan asked him to show him a secluded spot somewhere in the mountains and so Graham Presley took him to a spot called Lizard's Mouth. From hikespeak.com, quote, Lizard's Mouth is a mountaintop rock formation overlooking Santa Barbara. Wind-carved pockets on the underside of this sandstone outcropping give the rock a resemblance to a frog or lizard's mouth. The short hike to Lizard's Mouth offers sensational views and is a quick excursion for anyone traveling the 154 between Santa Barbara and Lake Cachuma or Los Olivos. A path from West Camino Cielo meanders through boulders and brush, heading slightly uphill to a clear spot overlooking Santa Barbara. Although there are a few overlapping paths, they all lead to the same place. Turn right and ascend the slope of sandstone that forms the lizard's back. When the side of lizard's mouth becomes visible, either climb over the rocks to get to it or continue along the path as it swings around to the destination. 
An opening beneath the overhang makes for a good turnaround point. Climb up on the lizard and take in the panoramic views. The route back to the trailhead is the same and a bit easier to follow in reverse. Lizard's Mouth offers a half-mile stroll with optional rock scrambling and obligatory views of Santa Barbara and the Pacific Ocean. The trail runs adjacent to the Winchester Canyon Gun Club, so be prepared to hear gunfire as you hike, especially on weekends. No fee or permit is required, so get out and enjoy. End quote. So, apparently Presley knew the spot well. He often went there to smoke some weed with his friends. It was already way past midnight when the two arrived at the rock formation, and then Hoyt handed Presley the shovel and told him to start digging. And Graham Presley would later testify that he was sure that he was now digging his own grave because he was a witness and that they wanted to get rid of him. So he starts digging and at one point Hoyt decides, you know, that's enough. And they just walk back to the car and drive to the Lemon Tree Inn to pick up Nick and Jesse Rugi. At that time, Nick, who had been sleeping for the most part of the last hour, was barely able to sit up straight, you know, because of all the weed and alcohol he had consumed during the night. Mm -hmm. So they are all in the car now, Nick, Jesse Rugi, Ryan Hoyt and Graham Presley, and they drive back to the trail that leads to Lizard's Mouth. They park... They start to walk up the trail, and then Presley suddenly realizes that it was actually Nick's grave he had been digging before, and he decides to turn around and get back into the car. So Nick follows Hoyt and Rugi to Lizard's Mouth, and I'm sure he still had no idea what they had planned. He trusted Jesse Rugi. On the way up, they even encounter a few people, there are more witnesses. Once they arrive at the grave, Rugi ties Nick's hands behind his back with duct tape and he promises the teenager that he wasn't going to hurt him, and Nick replied, saying, I know you won't. But then, Rugi starts to put duct tape over his mouth and nose, which makes Nick start to cry. They then drag him to the shallow grave and push him in. It's possible that they hit Nicholas in the head with a shovel, but nobody can say for sure, and it doesn't really make that much of a difference either way, because Ryan Hoyt takes aim at Nick, lying there in this freshly dug but very shallow grave, and he pulls the trigger at really point-blank range until the gun jams. Nick has been hit nine times in the head and torso. Nick is dead instantly, and the murderer and his accomplice start to quickly cover the grave, shoveling dirt back in, trying to cover the spot with twigs and leaves. They then return to the car, and they drive off. Hoyt threatens Presley that he's going to kill him too if he ever talks about anything that happened that night. But of course, Ryan Hoyt himself didn't keep his mouth shut. He went around town, he bragged everywhere about how he had taken care of a problem for Jesse James Hollywood. I don't know if anybody believed him or thought he was trying to make himself, a f you know, just appear tough. But a few days later, it was Hoyt's 21st birthday and his friends threw him a big party. There were three dozen guests and among them was Jesse James Hollywood. It seems like they all really thought that they had gotten away mm. with murdering Nick, but... Thankfully, they didn't. On Saturday, the 12th of August, 2000, so six days after Nick had gone missing, a couple of hikers arrived at Lizard's Mouth when they hear this extremely loud buzzing sound. They thought it was bees, and apparently they were not scared of bees or allergic to them because they followed the sound of the bees. But they didn't find bees. They found flies. Around a spot in the sand. Just hundreds of flies. And of course, a smell. A smell that you just can't mistake for anything else, the smell of decay. So they kicked the sand a little bit with their shoes just to see if they can find anything, and they did, something that looked like clothing. So now they knew that, you know, somebody hadn't buried a pet up there, for example. So they immediately call the authorities. And the police arrive, they close off the scene, they look for evidence, and they remove the body. It would take them two days to identify the body of 15-year-old Nicholas Markowitz because his body had been so heavily decomposed and it was very hard to get fingerprints. And, of course, it's California in mm. August, right? Southern California, even. On August 15th, the newspapers start printing the story that the police are looking for witnesses. The Los Angeles Times printed the following on that day. So this is page 91 of the Los Angeles Times. Body identified as Woodland Hills Boy, Nicholas Markowitz's remains were found by hikers near Santa Barbara. Coroner says he died from gunshot wounds by Xanto Peabody, Times staff writer. Quote, 
Remains found by hikers in the Los Padres National Forest have been identified as the body of a 15-year-old Woodland Hills boy, last seen August 6, Santa Barbara County authorities said Monday. Lieutenant Michael Burridge, a sheriff's department spokesman, said the body of Nicholas Sam Markowitz was discovered in a shallow grave Saturday. His family had reported him missing four days earlier. An autopsy conducted by the Santa Barbara County Coroner's Office revealed that Nicholas died from multiple gunshot wounds, Burridge said. Sheriff's detectives had not yet determined where the teen was killed, said Burridge, who would not say what type of weapon had been used. The department sought the public's help in solving the slaying. Quote, We're hoping someone may have seen him in the Santa Barbara area before his death, Burridge said. Ten Santa Barbara detectives spent Monday in Woodland Hills talking with family members and planning the investigation with detectives from the Los Angeles Police Department's West Valley Bureau, Burridge said. LAPD officials referred questions to the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department. The hikers found the grave near Lizard's Mouth Campground, about 12 miles north of Santa Barbara, off Highway 154. The area is a popular daytime hiking spot that has drawn nighttime crowds of partying teens, Burridge said. Quote, we see a lot of kids up there drinking. It's not an organized thing. It's just that you can easily access it, and it's relatively close to town. But it's rural, so it's still a little bit off the main road. End quote. I like it when he says, we're hoping someone may have seen him. And I yes. think there were like, what, 36, 37 witnesses to the whole thing. A lot of people saw him. A lot. Yeah. So many witnesses. Now, I don't know if this was the article or one of the many others uh, in any of the other local newspapers, but one of the girls who had named Nick the Stolen Boy came across this article or any of the others, and it showed Nick's photo and she didn't know the name. So up until that point, she was absolutely certain that Nick was back home safely and unharmed. But now she can see they lied to her. Nick had been murdered six days ago. And so she drives over to Jesse Rugi's house to confront him. She's calling him a murderer. And he's like, no, it doesn't have anything to do with it. He's still lying to her. That's terrifying, though, the fact that she did that. Just go straight to, yeah. don't confront the murderer, people. Just, yeah, yeah. just don't. Yeah, just call authorities. Please. Just call the police. <laughs> then she drives over to her mother's law firm. And she asks for legal advice on how to handle the situation. Because she is scared and she doesn't want, you know, to go to jail for her involvement. And the legal team tells her that she will be granted immunity if she tells the police everything. And as soon as she is sure that she will not be charged with anything, she finally comes forward and calls the police. And so the next day, which is Wednesday, 16th of August 2000, the police arrest Jesse Rugi, William Skidmore and Graham Presley. I think Graham Presley actually went to the police himself after they Bring arrested the other two. Yeah. yeah. Ryan Hoyt is arrested the next day on 17th of August. But they can't find Jesse James Hollywood. He's gone. And he will stay gone for a very long time. Nicholas Markowitz was laid to rest at Eden Memorial Park with more than 700 people present for the funeral. And one of the things that the family placed into the coffin with him was a photo of Nick's dog. And I hmm. think we can all relate to this a lot. Yeah. Yep. His headstone shows two photos. Uh, one of Nicholas around the age of 15. And the other one shows him as a toddler with his mom. And the inscription reads, Nicholas Samuel Markowitz, September 19th, 1984 to August 9th, 2000. Step softly. A dream lies here. Sweet dreams, Nick, our boy. There's also a memorial inscription at Lizard's Mouth Rock Formation, by the way. It's so sad. Now, about the people who had been arrested. So, Jesse Ruge denied ever having heard of a Nicholas Markowitz, who is he? I've never heard of him. He didn't know him. He never met him. He had just returned to Santa Barbara from a wedding he had attended. And he barely ever met any of his old friends anymore because he had stopped partying over a year ago. And when they asked him if he knew a Jesse from West Hills, he's like, yeah, I knew a Jesse. From West Hills, uh, I played Little League with him back in the days. Man, I don't even remember his last name. I haven't seen him in ages. I don't know who he thought he was fooling with this act. He was fooling no one, thankfully. Yeah, the police already knew most of the basics anyway. They had security camera footage from the Lemon Tree Inn. They knew Jesse Ruge had been there. And they also knew who had been there with him. Little by little, they all came clean and they were ended up being charged and sentenced in the following way. 
Ryan Hoyt was charged with the first-degree murder of Nicholas Markowitz. He was convicted on November 21, 2001, and sentenced to death on December 9, 2001. His family and friends kept fighting to get him a new trial because they felt his trial in 2001 had been unfair and that Hoyt had never received proper legal representation. Hoyt himself was quoted as saying something along the lines of, like, he didn't think his sentence was fair because all he did was pull the trigger. All he did was pull the trigger. I mean, that's the main part of every murder. Right. Murdering the person. That's... Yeah. All I did was pull the trigger, because if he had said no, who knows what would have happened. Maybe Nick would still be here. Maybe nobody would do it. I think there's a real problem with all these kids with just not taking any responsibility for anything. Nothing's ever their fault. You know. Ugh. Psst, gross. All right. I initially had a little bit more sympathy for him because I did actually think that he was the most naive and the most uh the most in need you know why people join gangs for example right yeah he was definitely the the i don't want to call it naive but he was the he was the easiest mark of the group he I was think. the easiest mark exactly yeah. yes thank I you i think so but that does not mean he's still not responsible for his own yeah. actions all I did was pull the trigger. I just can't get over that. It says everything no. you need to know, really, yeah. that, that one sentence. So in 2020, the Supreme Court affirmed the death sentence that was handed down in 2001, and Hoyt still remains on death row in San Quentin. Jesse Rugi was charged with aiding in the kidnap and murder of Nicholas Markowitz. He was convicted in 2002 of aggravated kidnapping for ransom or extortion with special circumstances. He was acquitted on the murder charge. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after seven years. He was granted parole after 11 years and left prison in 2013. The thing that I, I hate with these sentences is like, okay, you're given life in, life in prison, but then you're out in 11 years. Life in prison or 11 years, what's the difference, right? Like, I'm opposed to the death penalty, but I also really hate these bullshit life in sentence, hmm. prison sentences where someone's out in under a decade, and I know I'm not alone in that particular sentiment. William Skidmore, he was charged with kidnapping and robbery. In September 2002, he was sentenced to nine years in a state prison as part of a plea bargain, and he was released in April of 2009. Graham Presley was tried twice. In July 2002, he was acquitted of kidnapping, but the jury was hung on the murder charge. In October 2002, he was retried on the murder charge and was convicted of second-degree murder. Presley was incarcerated at a California Youth Authority facility until just before his 25th birthday in 2007. He has since been released. Now that leaves Jesse James Hollywood, who had mm -hmm. simply vanished. He was the youngest person to make it on the FBI's most wanted list. Congratulations, Jesse James. I bet he would take that as a sincere compliment. Yeah, absolutely. And it would take them years to find him. Of course, he was also featured on America's Most Wanted several times, and also on Dateline, I think. So he had emptied out his bank accounts, and he had been driving around the whole day, collecting money from people who owed him money. And then he fled with his girlfriend. And they went to Las Vegas, then they moved on to Colorado. The authorities were always just one step behind them. He did what most fugitives do. They go to places they already kind of know. Right, yeah. When you're on the run. Sure. In Colorado, Hollywood and his girlfriend did split up, so she returned to LA and he moved on by himself. First he went to Seattle, then to Canada, moving from place to place. Then he went to Mexico and he was looking for the perfect place to hide out and he thought he had found it in Brazil. During his time on the run, he had acquired fake papers, a fake passport, and now he had also a five-year visa for Brazil. He lived in Rio de Janeiro, close to Copacabana, under the fake name of Michael Costa Chirou, I think. G-I-R-O-U-X. Mm -hmm. He learned Portuguese, he worked as a nightclub promoter, an English tutor and a dog walker. He had a girlfriend and got her pregnant because he was thinking that Brazilian law would prevent him from ever being extradited when he fathered a child with a Brazilian citizen. Fun fact, 
that was actually the fact in the past, but not anymore. Brazil had changed that because of infamous train robber Ronnie Biggs, who had evaded justice for over 36 years living in Brazil. Hollywood didn't know that, but he would soon learn it the hard way. Authorities kept a close eye on the Hollywood family, of course, and finally they concluded that he must be hiding out in South America, and Brazil was one of the places they had on their list. And here is how they ultimately found him. They kept checking all kinds of things, of course, and one of those things was the phone records of the Hollywood family. And in 2005, they realized that a phone number kept popping up on that phone records. The number belonged to Jesse James Hollywood's cousin, and the detectives quickly figured out that she had recently applied for a Brazilian visa. So that meant she was traveling to Brazil, and the detectives thought, well, she was probably meeting up with her cousin. And they were right. On 9th of March 2005, Jesse James Hollywood was at the shopping mall where he was waiting for his cousin. But instead of his cousin, police showed up and he was swiftly arrested. And because he had entered the country with a fake passport, he was considered an illegal immigrant, which meant he was facing deportation. Jesse James Hollywood was finally brought to justice after almost five years. On March 11, 2005, the Los Angeles Times published an article titled Fugitive Kept Low Profile in Quiet Brazilian Beach Town. It was written by Henry Chu and Solomon Moore and was published on March 11, 2005, and I'm just going to read you a few excerpts from that. Brazil. People in this placid surfing town knew him as Miguel, the young gringo who lived with his Brazilian girlfriend and jogged on the beach with his two pit bulls. He seemed to drink a lot, kept to himself, and spoke hardly a word in his American-accented Portuguese. When he did, neighbors said it was often in a domestic quarrel or once in a drunken spat with customers in the bar across the street from the small beach house he shared with his girlfriend. Quote, he always had his head down, he never said anything, said Walma Lindbergh da Silva, who lived next door. I told my husband I thought there was something wrong about him, end quote. But that vague unease did not prepare da Silva for the news on her television Thursday. Miguel was actually Jesse James Hollywood, a fugitive and alleged drug dealer from the United States, accused of kidnapping and killing 15-year-old Nicholas Markowitz in a crime that made headlines five years ago. Despite being one of California's most wanted men, Hollywood was able to elude an international manhunt in this town near Rio de Janeiro. He told people that he worked as an English tutor, but Brazilian authorities said he actually received $1,200 monthly checks from his parents in California, enough to live a comfortable life. Using an Interpol warrant, Brazilian authorities arrested Hollywood, 25, on Tuesday at a shopping center just after he and his girlfriend sat down at an outdoor table. As he was led away in handcuffs, witnesses said his girlfriend cried, My son, my son, I have a son with him, end quote. We will link to the article in our sources if you would like to read the whole thing. Can I just pause it for a moment that his parents sending him 1200 mm -hmm. a month? Mm -hmm. I think the day they decided to go ahead and name that baby Jesse James Hollywood, like other parents start like a college fund or yep. first house fund or whatever they can afford to do. And I'm pretty sure his parents were like, we'll call him Jesse James Hollywood. I'll start the bail fund now. Right? Like... <laughs> Who also, are the these fact people? that his girlfriend was yelling, my son, my son, I have a son with him. I think he, what I read was that he instructed her on what to do if he ever... Yes. If was something arrested. like this ever happens. I don't think he told her arrested, but, you know, that if ever... Maybe he told her arrested for immigration reasons. I was just going to say, like, if they were, like, I love you. If they try to deport yeah. me, make sure they know we have a son together. Yeah, exactly. I think so, yeah. Totally makes sense. Yep. So it would take another four years before the trial against Jesse James Hollywood would begin. That was on May 15th, 2009. And after three days of deliberation, on July 8th, 2009, the verdict was read and the jury found him guilty of kidnapping and first degree murder, which means he was now eligible to join his good friend Hoyt on death row. After testimony from members of both the Markowitz and Hollywood families, on July 15, 2009, Hollywood was sentenced to life in prison as the jury recommended. And we'd love to tell you that that's the last anyone ever heard of Jesse James Hollywood, that he just moldered away in a prison. 
But of course, this human embodiment of a fungal infection would not stay quiet. Backed by his parents' money, he filed appeal after appeal, and each one, no doubt, was incredibly painful Mm. for Nick's many loved ones, right? That's actually one of the reasons I don't like the death penalty. They actually have to have many appeals for obvious reasons. So a lot of people don't know it costs more to execute someone. Like, it costs more taxpayer money to execute someone, and it's often more painful for the family because they have to keep going through this over and over every appeal. But Hollywood was appealing because he claimed he shouldn't be in prison because Nick could have left any time he wanted, and he wasn't responsible for the murder because he wasn't even there. He proved it. He took his girlfriend to the Outback Steakhouse, and he had credit card receipts. There were witnesses. Of course, that's why he took her. On February 5th, 2010, a judge said, No, I'm sorry. You're still guilty. And you know what? Just for the trouble, it's not just life in prison now. Now it's life with no possibility of parole. I like that judge. Good. Yeah. And then about two years later, on February 12th, 2012, the Court of Appeals denied his appeal for a new trial, upholding his conviction again. In 2014... Jesse James Hollywood got married to a woman who had started writing letters to him after his trial. And that's where we are now. Ryan Hoyt and Jesse James Hollywood remain in prison to this day. And we said it before, if you want to know more, please read Susan Markowitz's book. You will get more in-depth information about how the family dealt with the loss of Nicholas and how they dealt with the trials and the aftermath. The last thing I want to mention, and I only mention it because it's also in her book, It's something that we have talked about several times before. Susan seems to be just like us, a believer in signs of your loved ones on the other side. In her book, she talks about how, as a kid, Nick was fascinated by praying mantises. And after his death, she started seeing praying mantises regularly, and she was even able to hold them in her hands. And for her, that's a high from Nick. Yeah. And if you are a regular listener, you know that we 1000% believe in signs and we have our own experiences with them. Definitely. Praying mantises, I mean, they are around here, but I feel like in my life, I could count on my fingers how many times I've seen one in the wild. So that really does seem like a pretty special sign. But yeah, the case is, it's just, it's just devastating. It's so heartbreaking for everyone in the Markowitz family, even Ben, who I'm sure plenty of people blame for what happened. I imagine he has plenty of blame on himself, but I don't think this is the kind of thing anyone could foresee coming, right? It was so unnecessarily casually cruel. Like, these weren't super violent kids prior to this, were they? They were playing tough. They were acting like they were kind of Pablo Escobar in West Hills. Exactly. I'm not sure how violent they were, but they were not violent in a way where you'd think they shoot somebody. Right. That had done nothing wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just such a sad case, and we just send our love to the Markowitz family, and of course, any of Nick's friends and other loved ones. It's just such a waste of just a really, really lovely human being who was taken too soon. Do you have something good? My something good this week is that one of the plus sides of living in a teeny tiny village in the countryside now is that I can just walk across the street, open the fridge in front of my neighbor's house, take 10 eggs, and throw the money in the mailbox. That's awesome. Do you have these kind of things where you have this uh, 24 yes. hours little tiny roadside farm stores where you can just walk in, take what you need, and leave the money? Thank totally. You. Yep. On on I the Cape, it. Route 6A is like the old main road that used to go before there was a highway. So especially along Route 6A in the summertime, you'll see just little farm stands outside of people's houses selling, you know, fresh flowers, like you said, eggs, yeah. produce, anything they've grown. Yeah, it's cool. I just bought um like a tin, old tin bathtub for the garden where I want to plant uh, herbs in. Oh, I and love that. I drove there and... I found it in the in the classifieds, and the woman wrote me, "Oh, just uh, when you walk into the door, just open the door of the of the courtyard, and it's gonna be standing on the left. Just leave the money in the in the mailbox. Just I take it and that. leave the money there." Yeah, I love, I love that. It would never happen in the big cities, of course, because you couldn't leave something standing there. People would steal it. I know. Yeah, yeah, and the actually the um, 
the breeders that we got opus from are the loveliest people and they have a farm in if anybody listening is near Deering, New Hampshire. They have the most beautiful farm stand where they sell everything from fresh produce and meat from their farm to uh, she makes amazing baked goods. It's really it's really great River Run Farm in Deering, New Hampshire. Check them out. My something good. Oh, my daffodils bloomed. So I'm really happy. I finally have daffodils blooming. Also, the forsythia is blooming. So it's finally starting to feel like spring. I'm very excited. If you like this episode or any of our other episodes, please do us a huge, huge, huge favor. Go to your favorite podcast app and check if you can leave us a rating and or review. We are getting so many lovely reviews. And any, I think we are going to be making it to 1000, right? I really Soon. hope so. It's, it's my goal. Um, my, my, I'm, I'm looking right now to see where we are. I usually check every morning, actually, which is lame. <laughs> what else am I doing? 940. That's great. Wow. 60 more and we're there. Yeah. Thank you. You can visit our webpage to find out all kinds of information. And that is freshhellpodcast.com. Our friend Tammy is working with us to update that soon. But in the meantime, you'll be able to find links to where you can listen to us, how to get in touch with us, where our Patreon is. We invite you to join our Facebook group. Just search Fresh Hell Podcast Murder and you will find us. It's such a great group. We were actually just diving more into the Malvina Kretz case after we posted the information on that episode. One of the people in the Facebook group was showing us what mucklucks, you know, the how she was described as wearing mucklucks on her feet, and they're like slipper socks. So you absolutely could have pulled her trousers over them. If anybody remembers that case was just two episodes ago. It's such a great group. Everyone there is just amazing. Our email is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. And on our website, you'll also find our P.O. box. What else? The podcast magazine Hot 50. Please, if you have time, it will take you... If you are once you're registered, it takes you like five seconds daily. You can vote for your three favorite podcasts, I think. That's right. right. Yep. And you have one vote per day. Just Google podcast magazine Hot 50 and it will pop right up. And yeah, we're trying to make it to the top 10. So that's my goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have goals. Tell your pets, we said hi, we love them, we miss them, we hug them, we want to see all the photos of your guinea pigs, your rabbits, your dogs, your cats, your wallabies. I'm afraid Paul wants an axolotl. I love axolotls. Uh, somebody had a pet squirrel. Please, if you have like a raven, that would be cool. That's what we're missing. A crow, something, a bird that collects money for you that he <laughs> finds in the street. That would be a cool pet. So if you have one of those, tell us, please. And also... When your crow isn't stealing money from other people, be kind to everybody else because give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, everybody's Things stressed are hard out but right now. People are nice. Everybody's <laughs> tired. So, yeah, be patient with everybody, including yourself, please. Yeah, please. And if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye bye.